this lecture is about state model equations of continuous linear systems. For those of you who are able to read Portuguese, you can uh, look at the book Control nos Passos de Estados, written by myself and edited by EST Press in chapter one, pages 27 to 63. Let's start by considering a very simple model, it's a very simple example. And the example consists of a very simplified uh, magnetic uh, suspension in which uh, we have a signal U, electrical signal U that is amplified and creates a current around an electromagnet that attracts a small metallic sphere. And uh, we want to model the relation between U and the position of the sphere in some uh, coordinate system Y. So by Newton's law, the mass times the acceleration, that is to say the second derivative of Y with respect to time, is equal to the sum of forces applied. And let's make uh, the assumption that uh, we consider a part of the force that is, or part of the signal that compensates for the force of gravity. So we only consider an increment, incremental variation with respect to this value. And also we assume that M is one. So somehow we normalize the mass. And uh, we end up with this model. So it's, uh, so-called second integrator. So Y is a double integrator of U and uh, the second derivative of Y is equal to U. Now, take as variables the position Y and I call it X1 and the velocity X2 that is given by X dot. So uh, by y dot, so the derivative with respect to time of y. And these variables x1 and x2 together with the control variable u form a system of two first order differential equations. The x1 dt equal to x2 and the x2 dt equal to u. This is the state model that is equivalent to the second order differential equation. So we can describe the system either by the system of uh, two first order ODEs or by a second order uh, equations. In both cases, we have to specify two initial conditions for the position and the velocity. We can also write this in matrix form. <coughs> So uh, we define the vector of derivatives, x1 dot and x2 dot. We derive the vector made of x1 and x2. This is the state vector. And uh, we have the input. And then we have these matrices that we will call A and B. And then we have another equation that relates y with the state. And in this case, y is equal to x1. So uh, this is just a matrix made of one and zero times x1 and x2. This is the state model of the suspension and x1, x2 is the system state. What is the state? It's a set of variables such as you have to know them to uh, be able, based on the differential equations that describe the system and on the knowledge of the inputs that act on the system to know its evolution in the future. If, for instance, you only knew the position at some time, you wouldn't be able to um, compute 
the future values of the position because you also need the velocity. You need two initial conditions. Now, uh, let's write this in a standard form. So, uh, consider the matrix form of these equations and define the matrix is A, B, C, and also this matrix D, which in this case is just a scalar and it's zero. And we can write equations in this so-called standard form for the linear state model, x dot equal to ax plus bu and y equal to cx plus du. In many cases, the matrix D is zero because the matrix D corresponds to a immediate action of the input in the output of the system. And in many cases, you don't have such an instantaneous action. So in many cases, you have D equal to zero, although not always, but in general, in the course, we will consider D to be zero. So remember this definition of state, this definition will be instrumental for all the course that we are going to undertake. A vector of variables, such that if known at a certain time, and if the future values of the input variables are also known, uh, such that it is possible to compute all their future values by integrating the state equations, this is the definition of state. Now, we can think that the state variables define a state, uh, a space, a linear space, in which we have axes associated to each of the state variables. And at certain, some time, we have uh, x1 of t and x2 of t. So this is the state at time t. For when t changes, uh, this state changes also. So uh, the state at one at uh, one time instant corresponds to a point in the so-called state space, the space made of the state variables. And actually, this is a linear space. Now, from the equations, you can see that when time changes, uh, the, the position of the state in state space cannot move in an arbitrary way. It moves according to the equations. For instance, if you are at the state, initially at the state marked by corresponding to point A, what happens? Both x1 and x2 are positive. If x1 is, uh, if x2 is positive, then the derivative of x1 is and then the derivative of x1 is positive and this means that x1 will increase now if you take u equal to zero dx to dt equal to u and u is zero so dx to dt is zero so you don't change at point a you don't change along the direction of x2 but you increase the value of x1 so you will be moving uh, in the direction of this error as time goes by. And then you will go to other points nearby. So you can use information about the derivatives of the state to um, decide where how the state changes when time changes. Let's present uh, a number of examples of state of systems described by their state model. Take uh, to start this electrical circuit made of two capacitors and two resistors and one current source. And take as the entry the current forced by the current source and uh, as output tension V2 of this terminal with respect to the reference node marked here by this symbol. You can uh, apply Kirchhoff laws of equilibrium of uh, currents to uh, the currents in this point and this point and write these equations. 
And if you divide everything by C1 and C2, then you end up with um, a state model. And uh, um, in the standard form, it is A, B, C, take this form, and D is again zero. Let us consider another example, a DC motor. The physical structure of a DC motor is seen here. So you have basically two parts. The, 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 the mass of the motor, and this is, we call it the stator, because it, is, uh, it does not move, it is static. And you have the rotor that rotates. And the rotor contains what? Contains a number of coils. And the stator contains something that creates a magnetic field. This something can be either electrical uh, coils or um, permanent magnet. Suppose that it was permanent magnet. So look at this uh, schematic view of the motor. When you have one coil in the magnetic field created by this permanent matter, this species that generate here, induce here a uh, uh, magnetic field, then, then uh, if you have a current that um, passes through this coil, this this is this current is perpendicular to the uh, magnetic field and it generates an electromagnetic force that forces the the coil the the coil to to rotate now when you rotate it by 180 degrees you are inverting the sense of of the current so you can place here uh, this piece which is made of two um, contacts and uh, together with a sliding contact attached to the coil. And it is such that when you rotate this, you are inverting the sense of the current. So uh, that when you, um, the coil uh, rotates by 180 degrees, the force is always in the same sense and the motor is meant to rotate. Now, a true, in a true motor, you don't have just one spiral of the coil. You have many, many spirals, as you can see here. You can model the DC motor in this way. So uh, we know that the stator generates a magnetic field. So we put here something that uh, remembers us of that fact. In this case, it, it is a, a coil connected to a, a voltage source. And the rotor is a coil, and it has some resistant, resistive part, some inductive part, L, and uh, when you apply uh, when you apply attention, you you will have a current that corresponds to the reaction of this circuit. Now, when the coil is rotating, the motor acts also as a generator. So there is a counter electromotive electromotive uh, force E which is proportional to the, to the rotation. So uh, this tension here is proportional to the velocity of the rotation of the rotor. And if the motor is, uh, the, the rotor is solidary with some load, as you can see here, with some moment of inertia J and some friction, then you can write an electrical, uh, an electrical equation for the electrical circuit and a mechanical equation for the rotation of the rotor. And these are coupled by the fact that uh, the, 
the couple the the binary of uh, that forces the rotation is proportional to the current and the counter electromotrix force is proportional to the rotation uh, to the velocity of the rotation to the angular velocity of the motor so if you write the equation for the circuit you do uh, you do uh, uh, an equilibrium you write equilibrium equation for the for the tension and you know that u the tension u is equal to the drop of tensions in r in l and e and the drop of tension in l is l the inductance of the of the of the inductor times the time derivative of the current and this must be equal to u so this is the electrical the electrical uh, equation uh, for the rotor for the shaft rotation you have that the moment of inertia times the rotation acceleration so the the, the angular acceleration is equal to the torque minus a friction term that we assume proportional to the angular velocity omega now we can uh, couple these two equations by assuming that uh, the torque is proportional to the, is proportional to the velocity to the current and e is proportional to the uh, to omega so you end up with this set of equations that you can write in the standard form. So this is matrix A, this is matrix B. And if you measure the angular velocity, then Y is just one zero times X. You can also think how to modify this model if you consider the angular, the angle, of rotation not the velocity but the angle so you have to add, add an extra state for this equations so in general in general the state model for a linear system can be written as x dot equal to ax plus bu with some initial conditions x of zero equal to some specified x zero and this is the so-called dynamic or state equation and then you have the output equation that expresses the output that you measure as a function of the state and of the input and as i said usually d is zero now usually we uh, denote by small n the number of elements of x by small m the number of elements the number of inputs usually we take we will be taking one uh, input and uh, then p the number of outputs usually again we are going to take one output but one of the powers of this description it is that it is it can re readily be used to describe multivariable systems. If you want to draw a block diagram of the state model, what do you need? You need amplifiers, a summation point, and uh, a battery of uh, intuators. So assume that you have a battery of intuators that are represented by this symbol and uh, assume that the output of the integrators is the vector state x so at the input of the integrators you have the derivative of the state x because if you integrate the derivative of x you get x now you to force that the input of the integrator is the derivative of x you have to build this signal here in such a way that it is look at the equation 
AX plus BU, so you pick up X, you multiply by a matrix gain A, and you sum from U multiplied by a matrix B. And to obtain the output equation, you uh, just multiply X by C. So in this way, you can uh, represent the block diagram of the state model, and you can easily simu simulate it, for instance, using the simulink. Let us give a more detailed example. Suppose that we have this state equation, and uh, you, you uh, expand this, ma this matrix products to say that x1 dot is just x2. Actually, x1 dot is the first, you multiply the first row of this matrix, say, by x. So it's uh, 0 x1 plus 1 x2. So it's x2 plus 0 u. So it says x2. And you do the same for uh, x2 dot for the second derivative. Now, you have two equations, so you need two integrators. And you place the two integrators here, as you can see in step A of plotting the block diagram. So you put the two integrators. This integrator has output x1 and input x1 dot. And this integrator has output x2 and input x2 dot. Now, uh, look at the first equation x1 dot is x2, so you are going to connect x1 dot to x2 and you connect these two points. Now, uh, write the second equation. So you have to pick x1 multiplied by minus 2, so you pick x1, you multiply it by minus 2, and you add it to what? To minus 2x2, so you pick up x2, multiply by minus 2, and add it there. And plus 3u. So you pick up u, you multiply by 3, and you add it there. So you have this uh, summation point. Now, if you want to write the output, the output is 4x1 plus 5x2. So you pick up x1, multiply by 4, pick up x x2 multiplied by 5 and sum and you have y. So this block diagram allows you to represent these equations and can be used to make a simulation in Simulink with just integrators and uh, gains and summation points. And what about the initial conditions? You force the initial conditions by forcing the initial conditions of, of the integrators in both variables. How can we select the state variables? Actually, uh, the, say, the, state variable, the state variables for one system are not unique. We are going to see that. Actually, there is an infinite uh, number of possibilities of to write a state model for a given linear system, that they are equivalent in the sense that they all have the same transfer function. But if you want to write uh, the state equations, you can sometimes, if it is a physical system, you can use physical variables such as position, velocity, or temperature, or entropy, or uh, angular velocity, and so on. Or you can define the state variables mathematically. We are going to uh, see that later. Now, we have already spoken about the state plane. Let's give another example. And this example is for a system that has no input. So the input is 0. We call it an autonomous system with some initial conditions. Suppose that somehow you solve these equations. Actually, these equations can be readily solved analytically. At this moment, we don't know how to solve them, but they can. 
or you can think that you somehow solve them numerically. You have a numeric approximation of the solutions. The important thing is that you solve these equations starting from these initial conditions. So you have the x1 and x2 evolution in time, or you can think that you eliminate time and express x2 as a function for x1. So for instance, at point for a time instant t1, you get these two coordinates for x1 and x2. And uh, you mark one point here. At the same at point at time t2, you have uh, the two coordinates and you mark another point. And you do this for all time, so you have a curve. You have a curve. And we call this a state trajectory in the state plane. So you should bear in mind these two, that these two representations are equivalent, but they are different. Here, you are representing the variables as a function of time. Here, you are representing the variables in the state plane, and a point here is a function of time. So time appears as a parameter. Of course, you can have also uh, this type of diagrams in state space uh, in, a, in others in dimensions than two. For instance, in, for these three equations, you have a three-dimensional state space, and you have this nice curly uh, state trajectory, or we also call it orbit. So orbit is a synonymous to state trajectory. So a state trajectory is nothing more than starting with an initial condition, and integrating the equations and seeing the curve and in a state space. Now, there is a relationship between transfer functions and state models. State, state models and transfer functions are both ways of representing linear systems, linear dynamic systems. So uh, let's solve these two problems. One of the problems is given the state model, what is the equivalent transfer function? The second model is the converse one. Given the transfer function, how can I get a state model that has this transfer function that is equal to this transfer function, represents this transfer function? So let's solve these two problems. To obtain the transfer function from the state model, we can use the Laplace transform. Remember what is the transfer function. The transfer function is the quotient of the Laplace transform of the output divided by the Laplace transform of the input for zero initial conditions. And uh, so let's apply this definition here. Pick up your linear state model represented. Uh, using the standard form x dot equal to ax plus bu y equal to cx and apply the Laplace transform to these equations so with zero initial conditions so if you take the Laplace transform of x dot with zero initial conditions it is just s times x of s where s is the Laplace variable that lives in the set of uh, complex numbers it's a complex variable so uh, the lap, applying the Laplace transform to the dynamic state equation amounts to nothing more than Sx equal to Ax plus Bu. And uh, for the output equation, well, it's the Laplace transform of y equals to C times the Laplace transform of x. So y is equal to Cx. Now, from this equation obtained, using the Laplace transform, you can uh, write it in this way. Why, why do we need an identity matrix here? Remember that S is a scalar and A is a matrix. So when you write Sx, uh, if you want to put uh, X in evidence in these two terms, you need to write here an identity. That changes nothing because I times X is equal to X. And then you invert Si minus A 
So your state is the inverse of SI minus A times B, times the Laplace transform of the input. Now we remember the second uh, equation, which is Y equal to CX, and just multiply by C, and Y is equal to C, the inverse of is SI minus A times B, times US. And the Laplace, the transfer function, is the quotient of y and u. So the transfer function is nothing more than c si minus a inverse times b. So as shown here, as shown here. Now, uh, remember that you can invert a matrix by computing is a joint matrix and divided by its determinant. So you can write G as C, a joint of SI minus AB, divided by the determinant of SI minus A. So this is actually a quotient of polynomials. And this polynomial determinant of SI minus A is the characteristic polynomial of A, the so-called characteristic polynomial. A. The poles of the system are the roots of the denominator of the transfer function. So the poles of the system are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. And the zeros, the zeros are the roots. This is a polynomial in S because uh, the adjoint of SI minus A is a matrix. If you multiply it by a column vector, this is uh, again a column vector, and you multiply C, which is a row vector, by a column vector, so you get a scalar. And this scalar depends on S. So this is a polynomial in S. And the roots of this polynomial are the zeros of the system. Now, it's interesting to see that the poles of the system depend only on matrix A. And you know that the poles determine the type of dynamics that you have, the, determine whether the system is stable or unstable, is faster in response or not so fast, is, has a oscillatory behavior in response to a step and so on. The zeros, on the other way, depend not only on the dynamic of the system on A, but they also depend on the interaction with the actuators, the matrix B, and uh, the action with the sensors, the interaction with the sensors, the matrix C. So the zeros depend on the way the system interacts with its environment in a qualitative sense, we can say that. Now, let us uh, briefly remember uh, how to comp compute the adjoint of a matrix. Uh, the adjoint of a matrix, M, is the transpose of the matrix of cofactors. So a cofactor is the determinant of the matrix obtained by the eliminating row I and column J and multiply this by minus one up to I plus J. Uh, and this is a simple example. Suppose that you have a two by two matrix where you have uh, the, the entries given by A, B, C, and D. So, uh, if you want to compute the cofactor associated to A, you eliminate the first column and the first row, you get B. Now, A is, uh, as a new L, is an element with indexes 1, 1, 1 plus 1, so I equal to 1, J equal to 1. You add them and you get an uh, even number, 2. So minus 1 up to 2 is 1. So the, uh, you should pick up here and put a D. And so on, you progress and then don't forget to make the transpose and you get this result. I'll let you do the computations by yourselves. And this is another example for a 3x3 three three matrix. Again, I will let you do the example by yourself. Okay, we have already defined poles and zeros, 
and the characteristic polynomial. And uh, you can see here one example of computing the transfer function from the state model. So given matrices A, B, and C, you just compute the inverse of SI minus A, and uh, then you apply the formula that we have uh, obtained, and you get the transfer function. Now, we have solved the problem of, given the state model, obtaining the transfer function. Now, let's consider the other problem, which is given a transfer function, obtain a, trans, a state model that represents it. And I'm going to solve this problem in two steps. In the first step, I'm going to consider systems without zeros. So just with poles. And then I will modify um, this method to include uh, situations in which we have zeros. So suppose that we have a transfer function of third order. Let's do this in third order. It will be clear for any other order. And this transfer function has a, um, a constant parameter in the numerator, so has no zeros, and has a polynomial in the denominator it's of order three. So in this case, we call n the number of state variables it's equal to three. We, you need three state variables. It's the degree of the polynomial appear in the denominator of the transfer function. Now, the first step is transfer or transform the transfer function to a differential equation that is equivalent. And from the fact that y is equal to gu, you can write this equation, which should be obvious from, uh, from this uh, step. So uh, now we use the fact that this S cube Y is a third derivative of Y, S squared Y is a second derivative of Y, and so on. So you obtain the differential equation in this way. Now, from the differential equation, Let's uh, define state variables given by the output and the derivatives of the output up to order n minus one. So in this case, the order is three, so n minus one is two. So you need uh, state variables y and the first two derivatives up to the derivative of second order. And so I define as state variables x1 equal to y, x2 equal to y dot, x3 equal to y double dot. Now, from the definition, you immediately get equations for x1 and x2 dot. Because y dot is the derivative of y, is the derivative of x1. So y dot is nothing more than x1 dot. So x1 dot is x2. And uh, y double dot, y double dot, is the derivative of y dot, and y dot is x2. So y double dot is x2 dot, so x2 dot is equal to x3. So in this way, you could get two of the equations for x1 and x2. Now, to get the third, e third equation for x3 dot, Use the, you, you use the differential equation because you know that y is x1, y dot is x2, y double dot is x3, and this is x3 dot. So x3 dot is equal to minus everything else, which gives you this um, expression here. So to sum up, we end up with this set of differential equations, first order. The first two were obtained by the definition of the state variables, and the last one was obtained from the definition and the differential equation. And you can write this in a, uh, using matrix, matrix notation. So you have matrix A, matrix B, and matrix C.
one uh, word of mention is uh, due to the fact that the matrix A as this structure, you see, you have here an identity of order n minus, minus one. Then you have here a column of zeros and here you have minus the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So you can write it almost by inspection. These matrices have a number of interesting properties that we are not going to study. So they deserve a name. And the name is companion form. In Portuguese, forma companheira. Now, we have learned how to solve, how to obtain the state model for systems without zeros. Now consider, imagine that the system had a zero, is zero S plus B1. So the trick that we are going to do is to break the system, the transfer function in two parts. One only with a zero, one only with the poles, and one only with the zeros. The part here with the zeros is non-causal, but this is just a mathematical trick, so we don't bother about that. And we define x1 to be the output of the transfer function just with poles of this transfer function. Now, before we learned how to write the state equations for the state equation for, for this part here, assuming that y was equal to x1. Now, uh, what happens? We have this extra part and y, y is equal to b0s x1 plus b1 x1. But b1 x1, all right, is b1 x1, but b0s x1 is b0 x2. So y, is nothing more than uh, B1X1 plus B0X2. So you have this you have this matrix for the output equation. And the, the dynamic equations are the same as before. <clears throat> are the same as before. Now, one thing, once you have a state model, you can have as many state models as you want. Actually, there are infinite state models. So uh, how can we, let's see how can we obtain the state models. You can do it by change of coordinates. Let's uh, um, see what happens when you do a change of coordinates. So imagine that you have your state model, x dot equal to ax plus bu, y equal to cx, and you do a coordinate transform according to the multiplication by a matrix. This matrix must be square so that the number of variables in z are the same as the number of variables in x, and invertible so that you can transform x to z, but also z to x as well. So what is the state model verified by z? Uh, take z equal to tx and differentiate it. So z dot equals to tx dot. Now use the state model for x dot. So x dot is equal to ax plus bu. Now use the inverse transform so that you transform uh, x to the z coordinate. So x, x is equal to t minus one z. So you end up with z naught equal to t a t minus one z plus t b u. And the same here, y is equal to cx. So use the uh, mapping from x to z to write it as c t minus one z. So the conclusion is that when you have a state model written in these x coordinates, you define a linear coordinate transform associated to a matrix T that is square and invertible. And you get another set of uh, equations 
for z, uh, for the z coordinates, that now the dynamic matrix that I call E is T80 minus 1. The uh, matrix that multiplies U that I call gamma is, let me see, T B. It was not written here. And uh, the output equation is H Z, where H is C T minus one. And you can find as many of these tensor functions. Now, how can we explore this? We are going to explore this uh, sometimes uh, along the course by defining coordinate systems for which certain problems can be more easily solved. And this is a very big advantage of the state model. And um, this is all for this introductory lecture for the state model.